everyone and welcome to the second episode of our podcast. Here we talk about our ideas, mostly terrible, sometimes good, and hope that you learn something from what we say. I'm today's host, Jamie, and today we have Vic returning from episode one and Cheng Si joining us today. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to introduce yourself? Okay, um, hi, I'm Chen Si. I, I'm here because I can... Sp- uh, okay, I, didn't, I cannot speak French, but <laughs> I studied French for since I was set one as a third language and I can kind of speak a little bit of Mandarin like everyone else here. Yeah. I, I excuse you, I can't speak a word of Mandarin. Oh, okay, that's, I mean, that makes me feel better about myself for <laughs> being so mediocre at you. It's okay, Um, we don't really need... Actually, yeah, we do. Okay, we, we'll move on. So... Today's episode is an extension of the first one, but now we're delving into the etymology of English, which is to say we're going to talk about the origins and the development of English as a language. When languages split, how and why do you think other languages get incorporated into English? Which contact? Context? Um, so, like, when languages get into contact with each other, so like, for example, in Singapore, where we have, like, English and Chinese and, like, Malay and all that, they are, like, you end up mixing out the languages and that, like, forms a new language. You know what I mean? So, like, in Singapore, that would be Singlish? We talked about this in the last episode, right? Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's like, hmm? for example, like, Singlish, because it's, like, English and then, like, Mandarin, like, Chinese, and then Malay. So then they all mix together and you become new language. But strictly Language speaking... contact, baby. What? <laughs> I can't believe you just said that. Okay, but strictly speaking, is Singlish really a whole nother language? It is... Really? Uh, I forgot the word for it. It is a... Creole. Yes. Creole, right? Yes, yeah. it's on its way to become a language. To becoming a language. We're oh. almost there. So what? Give, yeah, a, give or take another 30 years. 300 years. Who knows? Okay. Yeah, Chang Si? I mean, I think that Singlish in its own right has its own particular grammar rules and syntax and um words that have come from like so many different languages that it is a language in its own right, even though it is mostly it's a very English based language, but um me- like as we said, many years down the road it could totally become a new language. Actually, if we delve into the specifics of Singlish, what is the syntax? Like, oh my gosh, I did research on it. It has its own grammar and everything. Like when you speak Singlish, you don't you don't use like proper English grammar. You like the gra- the grammar is quite tweaked. Like, and if you say something in like the wrong way, it sounds wrong. Mm, I don't yeah, know how to like explain most, it. Most yeah, like most colloquial languages, like even like African American vernacular English, like. They have a very specific grammar and syntax that if we do not adhere to it, it will make the language just sound off. Like, I have not, uh, I'm not really certain on the specifics of all these, but it is definitely, like, it, it's definitely different from English. And to try to imitate it without without understanding the full syntax and, like, mm. uh, all the grammar rules behind uh, these colloquial languages would be... You know, just dumb because that's not how it works. <laughs> you need so you like you kind of need an intuitive oops, an intuitive feel for it. Or you learn by hearing it. Yeah, uh it's not it, I mean you can I'm sure like I mean I know that there are like so many singlish dictionaries online that you can look at and you can like definitely learn the syntax like you can learn any other language but mm-hmm. uh it's not something that we can just imitate you know like it's not like even though singlish has an energy that people try to imitate it's not singlish because it doesn't have the specific grammar uh, grammar rules and in a uh, syntax that singlish has oh i see wow so actually when languages do form what what determines what um influences it the most so like I think Singlish is most heavily influenced by Hokkien, maybe? I think In it's... Malay? Is it Malay? It's quite... It's a mix. It's, like, really a mix. 
Like, there's like, really no I mean, fixed ratio of what. It. I mean, the kind of Singlish that is used differs from people with different, uh, in different social classes and like of different ethnicities and upbringing. Like when I was growing up, my parents did not allow me to speak Singlish. Oh, so same. my Singlish is really, really English. Same. <laughs> That's what my friends tell me, and like they're just like, "Oh, you don't sound like you're speaking Singlish." And I was like, "I mean, like, I I don't know what to say to that because to me, this is Singlish, you know." Yeah, cause you have your own different live experiences. Hmm. But in the context like, of English, it's like, oh, sorry, Vic, do you have more to say? I think there's like different extents of Singlish also. Like what Chancey said lah, like some people have more, like stronger Singlish vocabulary that they use. Mm. Yeah, so like I use different extents of Singlish when I'm talking to different people. Oh yeah, I get that. I think I learned how to say jalat from you. Like I didn't know what I meant before that. Yeah, like, Jamie has never heard me speak, like, actual Singlish before. Should I, like, hover over your shoulder and wait for you to speak it to somebody? Okay, no, that, let's not do that. Mm. Okay. I don't think it'll come out near you. Like, even with Chen Xi, I don't speak Singlish. Like, mm. it really just, I... I think it depends on who you're talking to. Oh, yeah, it's the code switching thing you mentioned in the first episode, right? Yeah. So like, with some people, for example, like, more like, how do you say, like in the, for example, like in the heartlands, like people, the people there generally speak with more, with a la- larger variety of mixture of like, words from different languages, mm. rather than like, for example, when you're like, in, I don't know, in school, yep. in like, English class, you don't really use that much Singlish vocabulary, because mm-hmm. it's just not right, not the right context for it. Moving on, so Singlish is pretty much equally affected by the languages that it came from, but when it comes to English, it's specifically been most influenced by French. Apparently 45% of English words come from French, but why do you think that's the case? Gendered nouns in French itself come from like Latin. French is Latin mispronounced by Proto-Germans. Lol. That's actually really funny. (laughs) So if I mispronounce Chinese enough and I make enough people mispronounce Chinese, I can invent a new language. Yeah, totally. That's like how it works, man. Like, that's how dialects happen. Wait, seriously? If you mispronounce like, a language enough, dialects occur? No, because like, you see, like, the, the reason why there are so many dialects is because China, China is so big. Oh. And like, Mandarin itself is just one dialect in China. Mm. So, they are like, it's like, as you move away from each other, you will come up with like, um, words that uh, enter your vernacular as... You know, you are exposed to different environments and different people and you interact with the same people and kind of like you the evolution of species. That's like how like dialects form, I guess. Oh, I don't know why I always just thought that like different parts of China spoke different languages and they kind of merged into one. Like definitely like with the assumption that we all come from like one person. Like it's like, uh, not a theory. That's one the theory. There's the mitochondria Eve and all that. So that would mean that you know, that's how languages just form. Uh, I think because really as though. we move Sorry. away from each other, we just form different ways of speaking. Like, even if we talk about, like, Britain, like, it's like, the north of Britain has, like, a different accent from the south because uh, the north, like, if you Lack listen to proximity? the northern accents, they sound accents, they sound more like um, Scottish. Mm. So accents have a lot to do with proximity lah. Yeah. If there is like a lack of proximity, then accents form, and like from accents, like the the words you use and the way you talk is going to evolve over time. And if you do not interact with people from other places that speak the same language as you, you mm-hmm. may completely evolve into like a new language, and there's no going back. You know. A side note, but this sounds exactly like evolution in biology. There's a yeah, disruption, oh then yeah. That's mm. like where I'm taking all this structure from, it. I... Yes, Vic. I found my tree. Your tree? My language tree. There's a language tree? So it's like a family tree, but for languages? Yeah. Latin's not actually from German. Oh. Wait, you can't just leave Latin it. is I italic. Have... It's a romance language. Oh. Germanic is a whole different tree. Wait, so like the link is like from the Indo-European languages? Yeah. 
Yeah, English is actually a Germanic language. It's just that French people. German Germanic French. language. If it married French briefly. Mhm. Okay. Then wait, but if English is like largely based in Latin, then isn't um isn't Latin an Italic language as well? It is. So like English is just like a combination of all these things. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Actually then, how do the different like sentence structures develop? Because if you think about it, all languages come from each other, so shouldn't they all have similar sentence structures? I mean, of the three languages that I have a very vague understanding of, they all follow subject-verb-object structure, and the difference in these languages, as far as I can tell, is how it's used, like how this structure is used. For example, in Mandarin, grammatical structure does not matter as much as it does in English. Like in Mandarin, it will be extremely grammatical to place the object before the subject without it sounding it's in it's very passive because Mandarin is a very action-based language. But oh. for English, if you deviate from the subject verb object structure, you will end up sounding like you're speaking really passively because you're not placing the subject first. You're focusing on like the object. So an, what would an example of that be that you can try to think of now? <laughs> My God, I'm not like, Okay, for example, right, if I wanted to say 电脑游戏, comma, 我觉得很好玩, right? Like, it's like, I could write that in an essay as part of dialogue, obviously. Like, it's not exactly, like, super formal, but if I use it as dialogue, it, it would, would be not possible. sound that awkward. Mm. As opposed to video games, I like... I like to play them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Do you want to get into the specifics of French now? Okay, so... Um, just now we were talking about how English comes, like 45% of English comes from French, right? Yep. So the thing about languages is that, or the thing about French that I have realised is that a lot of French words come from um, English slang. So like for example, the word cool, like the French people, especially in France, use it. Um, in Canada, I think cool. they are more conservative regarding the use of French, but in France, there are a lot of um, slang words that are that are just stolen from English. Oh, I found that really interesting. Wait, so did they say cool, like with a French accent? Yeah, just like cool. Wow. Okay. Yeah, like it's like one time I asked like my French teacher how to say cool in French, and he was just like cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah, and I was like, huh? I mean, largely has to do with like globalization and the media being so. Anglicized, like, right? Like, accessible now, yeah. Uh, actually, um, if we are talking about anglicized, in France, mm-hmm. because of this policy called... Okay, um, in France, it's not exactly anglicized because the government has actually put policies in place to try to expose French people to French media. Oh, oh I think there's something like that in people, Canada also, yeah, right? Yeah, Where yeah, the radio the station has to pay... Critters, yeah. Mm. So how do, how is that tied into anglicization? Oh gosh, sorry. It's okay. Yeah, but then like even even but then even though that uh even though there's so much focus on French culture and the use of the French language, even reduce exposure to the English language, it still has an effect on French. You know, like it's like most French people. Uh, okay, maybe to say most French people would be a stretch, but uh most french people living in paris at the very least are able to speak english fluently oh yeah so it just depends on whether they are willing to speak english with you which is another issue altogether okay Okay. and then um, for french there's something that the french focus on a lot more than we do in english do you know about like the direct object direct object yeah direct and indirect objects no yes sir Oh, I mean, like obviously, if it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because every French book I read about the basics of French, but if I read, I once got some books on like linguistics and I could syntax mm-hmm. and I couldn't really find all these. So oh. like, is it like very big, big in English? Yeah, like I know we use it a lot, but it doesn't seem like we place a lot of emphasis on it, right? I mean, we use it like subconsciously because of grammar. Wait, we just wait, use wait. it. Firstly, what is but, like, direct object? It's like Jenny Kickball. Right. So like lacking, yeah. Lacking so like for example, like if I say I like to eat cheese fries, it's mm-hmm. cheese fries is an indirect object because there is to eat standing in the middle of the subject and the object. 
Oh. Aren't direct objects featured in uh, most languages? I feel like most languages have their own version of it. Yeah, but like, of these languages, the language that I felt really, really places emphasis on the direct object and indirect object yeah, is like, particularly like, evident. Especially because there oh. are different sets of pronouns used for the direct object and the indirect object. Oh, la versus la, right? That sounds like oh Chinese. no no, uh, la and la is for uh, la is for masculine it, yeah, objects masculine and feminine. la is for oh, male okay. objects. For the indirect object, there is a new set of pronouns. Like instead of la or la, they would use oh. three. Oh. Yeah. So what's an example of a sentence with a direct object? Okay, just now I said I like eating cheese, right? It's like Jim Dave fit so for my. I'm really rusty. I used to be okay at speaking French, but like not anymore. Need more practice. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Uh, and another way which um, English differs from French is uh, the sheer number of tenses that the French have for... Oh, the French have more? Yeah, like, okay, you would think we have a lot, right? But like, for the French, it's like... Okay, it's just complicated because my first language is English. For example, in English, we would say like, he was leaving. The fact that this happens over a period of time would put this in the imperfect tense if I'm not wrong. And then in French, it's broken down to like different parts. Like for example, there's this type of past tense, it's called the passé composé. And it just means this happened exactly, like this precise thing happened. And wow. that's different from English. But in, in English, you would say he left and he has left. And that is kind of like the simple past or like present perfect in English. But it's mm. kind of the same tense in French, which is like the passé des Oh. Yeah, which is like something that really confused me. Like I was so bad at past tense while I was studying. Like I only really got it in like the last year. I and like, don't there feel are a bad. Lot more, it's a confusing like, thing. The ones that we would focus on in speech more are like the imparfait, which you would, as I mentioned earlier, which uh, is used to describe what was happening or like the weather or stuff like that. For the pluperfect, it's present in French as well, which is basically like before the imperfect, which you can only use in that context, or at least uh, I could only use in that context as a beginner. In English, like an example would be, I had sang or he had gone. Yeah. Oh. It's just like really interesting how different languages have so many different tenses and they kind of mix and match it in different ways. So like mm. the tenses in French and English, two such related languages are so different because of like how language has evolved, you know. And even though like a lot of English comes from French and vice versa, especially for like millennials who like use a lot of slang. Oh uh, yeah. What have we learned from today's episode? <laughs> All the languages are kind of really close together. Dialects stem from lack of proximity between different between different parts of China. And if we go a bit further, in the context of French and English, even though they are both closely related to each other, and even though they both affect one another, they both have very different sentence structures, tenses, basically the syntax of the languages, which is actually really interesting. And also, Chen Si really likes cheese fries. <laughs> We also learned about Singlish briefly. Thank you for listening to us and <laughs> see you see you soon.